Um, our next speaker is um, somebody who has become very, very important in Sarah's circles recently. He's been sort of our go-to expert on dozens of things, um, has certainly guided the organization through a philosophy of how you might go about uh, detecting pulsars, the kind of equipment um, one might need. Uh, last year, he was our keynote speaker, um, and that has become a very popular um, YouTube video for us. Um, uh, Wolfgang, and I'll use American pronunciation on as much of this as I can because I would um, insult any German speaking uh, individual by attempting German pronunciations. But um, uh, Wolfgang is uh, a physicist. Uh, he received his PhD from the University of Bonn in 1979, and he's worked in academic positions for many years after that. He then worked in telecommunications industries before founding his own consulting company. And then after he retired, he got interested in radio astronomy. He's now president of the Astropiler Stockert organization. And I think most of you are very familiar with that. Um, because that is a prominent backdrop for most of his uh, Zoom presentations. Um, so at Astropiler Stockert, uh, they operate a 25 meter dish, uh, which is one of the world's largest, if not the world's largest uh, amateur radio uh, dishes. Um, and they have many other instruments on site, but all maintained purely on a voluntary basis. Um, so uh, Wolfgang and his team of volunteers simply do everything that would normally be done in a professional um, operation. Uh, he has over 10 years experience in the field of radio astronomy and his uh, personal scientific instrument, uh, interest is in transient phenomenon such as fast radio burst and masers. So he's going to talk to us today about uh, something that I think will benefit every single one of us. So, uh, Dr. Wolfgang Herman, over to you. Thanks very much. Thanks for the introduction. And uh, let me first see that I share my screen. I hope it's coming online now. Looks good Can to me. See? Okay. Well, thanks very much again for the introduction. Um, today I'm going to talk about not our big 25 meter dish, but talking about some smaller dishes that we are dealing with. And the, the question that might come up, uh, why are we interested in smaller dishes? When you have a 25 meter dish, a lot of things that you can do. So why bother with smaller dishes as well? Um, there are a number of reasons, a lot of motivation. Uh, first of all, we have a little bit more capability and capacity if we do lab courses when we have, especially with schools, when we have a larger number of um, students, we can split it up between telescopes. And also it's a very nice test bed for uh, testing a couple of things because it's much easier to handle if you want to do something on the big dish. It's always a multi-person effort and uh, not so easy to do. But maybe the biggest motivation is really a fun factor of it and the learning experience that you have with small dishes. And as it turns out over time, we have also been supporting other institutions with smaller dishes. So there are a lot of reasons why you want to uh, deal with some smaller dishes as well. Today, I'm planning to talk about five dishes, uh, all in L band, so all essentially directed at hydrogen and similar stuff. Uh, in the size between a little over three meter and 1.2 meter. And I have um, depicted them here in the sequence in the time sequence as we have built them. Um, the first one was a three meter dish, uh, which we erected in 2017, followed by the smallest one, a 1.2 meter dish. Then we have a th uh, another 2.3 meter dish. All these three are, let's say, our own. Um, they're located at our site, 
with the exception of the mobile one, which we can sort of uh, move around. And then we have two other dishes that we have been dealing with um, at the University of Bonn and another one at another university in the vicinity. So those are the ones that I'll be talking about. I will start by starting with our three meter dish going a little bit more in depth in there and then uh, go over the other instruments and see what is different, what is the same, what are the experiences from all these dishes. Okay, so <clears throat> let's start with our three meter exercise. And it all started with a donation from a member. He had a three meter dish, which was one of these former C-band uh, TV reception dishes. And he also had an Aegis rotor. That's the one that's depicted here, uh, this one. And it also came with a controller. Um, we found that the controller was not so useful for radio astronomy. It could have been used, but our main motivation to discard it was we wanted to be on the network uh, of our campus. So uh, we did not use it. When you, have the, when you have a dish, when you have a rotor, there are a lot of other things that you need. Uh, you're, you don't have a radio telescope with these two things alone. So you need to have a support structure, so how to put it on the ground. As I said, we wanted to have a new controller. You need a feed horn. You need a support for the feed horn. You need an LNA. Um, you, know, you need to know how do you, you analyze the signal. So you need a receiver uh, and, of course, all the software that goes with it. So that was sort of the starting point, two pieces, of, but we needed a lot more. And <clears throat> I will walk you through the process, uh, how we went about it. Let's first have a look at the sort of overall structure. Um, there is obviously the dish itself with the LNA and the low noise amplifier, and that goes via RF cable to, in our case, an outdoor cabinet. The cabinet is depicted here. It's actually a cable distribution cabinet from the telephone network, surplus piece of equipment, which we repurposed. And in our case, then we go um, that's a fairly long path from this outdoor cabinet into our indoor, uh, into the building. That's about, I think, 40 meters of cable. So we have some amplifiers in the outdoor cabinet to compensate for the lo loss. The indoor equipment, uh, what I'm showing here is a photograph of the rack where things are. Uh, there's more equipment here than actually belongs to the three meter dish, but it's a 19 inch rack where we house things. So let me go through the bits and pieces in a little bit more detail and start with the more or less mechanical setup. Um, you need something to support everything, to hold it. And um, we have a sort of tripod here uh, with a pole in the middle. It all started with a pole in just a pole in the middle. And we found uh, that that was not stable enough. You could, it was sort of shaking when there was wind and you could actually uh, shake it by hand. So um, the idea was to have these additional sheet metal pieces welded in there to give it more stability. Then <clears throat> given the size of the dish and the ability of the rotor, we needed counterweights. Uh, so there's a frame around here with counterweights. The rotor itself, um, is in this case, in this picture, is under a cover uh, to cover it a bit better from the rain. Uh, so again, the rotor without the cover is shown here. And then we have our dish and the feed horn. So this is the, the basic uh, foundation. And then we can have a look at the feed horn. We, ha we have decided to... Um, use a Kumar type feed horn. I need to get my phone cut off. So, okay, sorry. Um, there is a, a Kumar type feed horn that we built. It was uh, built from galvanized steel. Somebody took the effort to really build it from scratch from sheet pieces of galvanized sheet metal. And this uh, is the pattern of the, of the feed horn. So we rotated it and measured the uh, pattern of it. It's not ideal, but uh, sort of workable. Uh, we're satisfied with that. 
And then we thought about the LNA, um, the equipment that we had chosen uh, as the first stage is a device made by, Tri by a company, Triquint, uh, which now has been acquired by Corvo. So, but you can still get that. What we did, we purchased a little, not, not the chip itself, but a little board that was put on the chip, uh, where the chip was put on. And then we added some additional gain to it uh, with a SPF something, uh, which is which you can acquire relatively cheaply, which has a reasonable noise figure. The noise figure in this case is dominated by the first stage. Um, the, we measured the noise figure of that first stage to be 0.4 dB, and it didn't change with this additional gain by the second uh, amplifier, as you would expect. Now, we had to weatherproof that. Uh, so we took a standard die cast housing this is shown in the open here, sorry, um, in the, was opened here. So the two stages, and they're equipped with end connectors, so we can then connect it to our feed horn. The next thing that you need to have is a filter uh, to uh, filter out the um, frequency range of interest, which is around the 1,420 megahertz of the hydrogen line. And uh, what we have chosen to use is a cavity filter, um, which I find very in a very interesting design. It's uh, The design is by Matjats Wittmar uh, from Slovenia. And um, the nice thing about his design is that you can use standard parts. Typically, uh, the designs are that you have to actually mill it from a piece of aluminum. But in this case, um, he had uh, come up with a design which uses a standard aluminum profile and standard aluminum rods. And uh, yeah, then you, if you mount it reasonably precise, that's uh, all you have to do. What is shown here is the curve, the filter curve of that cavity filter. Um, since the uh, numbers are probably not, not very well legible on the screen here, the insertion loss is about 0.4 dB, and it's very flat. And the bandwidth is, uh, depending on whether what type you choose, it's around 40 megahertz in this case. So it's a, a nice filter that you can use. And as I said, the, the really the main motivation to use this kind of filter is uh, because it's easy to make. Um, yeah. And then what else do you need? Uh, you have your LNA, you have your feed horn, you have your filter, and then you need to analyze the signal. These days, you just use SDRs for that purpose. This is really the way to go. And now, uh, typically, we use the Ada and Pluto as sort of our standard SDR, but we also use others. Um, there are many things to be said about all the different SDRs. They all have pros and cons. The main reason why we use the Ada and Pluto as sort of our standard is the fact that it is uh, fairly gain stable. I come to that uh, later on as well, but uh, this is really the main motivation. And then, um, you need software, um, not only to control it, but uh, the, the telescope, which I'll talk about in a minute, but also you to do the analysis. Um, we are using two programs, um, and I'll talk about uh, briefly about that later on. We call them Spectrometer 2 and Continuum 2 for spectrometry and, and continuum observation. And the 2 stands for it's our second version. OK, on the controller side, we need to uh, have the possibility to move the telescope and to control it. And we had a number of requirements. Um, one requirement I had already mentioned, we wanted it to be network capable. So we would be able to access it through our uh, TCP IP network. Another requirement was that uh, we would like for reasons of efficiency to use as much 
of the software from the 25 meter dish. So the software was ready for controlling it. And we were looking at what options do we have to actually reuse much of that. The form factor had to be that it just fits in somehow into this outdoor uh, cabinet. And another requirement was the Aegis rotor is fitted with quarter two encoders for both the azimuth and the elevation. And of course, we need to, or we wanted to make use of these encoders to really uh, avoid having to add another encoder, things like that. The solution that we came up with was something where, which has essentially two main hardware components, uh, Raspberry Pi as a small Linux machine, certainly capable enough to do all the computation tasks that are required. And the other main element was a called MD49 motor controller board. Um, that's a board that is made by a UK company. And the benefit of that is it does come with quarter two encoders and could deliver the current in, in the power for the motors of the Aegis rotor. So this is the solution. Looking uh, at that in a little bit more detail, I have here a block diagram. And let's start with the rotor itself, uh, which essentially has inputs for the motor, so the, the drive current for the motors. And then, as I mentioned, it has quarter two encoders. So you have the two lines coming from each encoder. And these go, these uh, lines go into the MD49 controller, which then counts the, uh, the signal or uh, measures the angle in some unit. And it delivers the current for the motors. The controller itself is monitored and controlled by a serial communication interface which then talks to the Raspberry Pi. And just to complement things, there are two index uh, contacts on the Aegis rotor, which we put directly on the GPIO of the Raspberry Pi. An additional thing is um, due to some, I would not really call it a deficiency, but one of the uh, a design of the MD49 controller, that is it has certain situation when it uh, trips, for example, if there's an overcurrent on the motor, um, there may be a safety trip uh, to switch it off. And the only way to reset that is actually to power down the control and power it up again. And we didn't want to make that a manual process. So we have uh, introduced another switch here, which just cuts power and turns it on to the controller so we can remotely reset it. And then the connection to the outside is via Ethernet. And also there's a USB interface. The purpose of that I'll uh, explain later on. So this is the hardware design of our controller, which we used for this three meter dish. And as you can see later on, we're also using that on other dishes. The Corresponding software, um, as I said, we wanted to have as much as possible commonality with our 25 meter dish. And when we designed the 25 meter dish software, um, we didn't have in mind that it would possibly be used, reused on another telescope. But we did something fortunate. Uh, in hindsight, it is fortunate. Um, that is the structure of that. The idea of our control software is that there are certain functions which are separate from each other uh, and they all talk via a TCP IP connectivity. The basic reason for that is um, we, at the time when we designed the software, we had a concern. The concern was that maybe one computer would not be powerful enough to do all the, uh, the processing there and we might be in uh, forced to put things on different computers and then they need to talk somehow with another. So we made a TCP IP connectivity design, which was not necessary um, at the end, but uh, it helped us now because we had completely isolated different aspects of the overall 
functionality. And the basic idea here is we have something which we call a master or information broker. And that is nothing but just a, let's say, a list of status words. It contains everything that is known about the telescope, its position, and, and all sorts of things. And let me just explain that a bit, uh, how that works as an example. Let's say if we have our command interface here and we enter a target coordinate, let's say that is a target coordinate in equatorial coordinates. So this sets a couple of information here saying, okay, this uh, our target coordinate is an equatorial coordinate and this is the target coordinate. The coordinate conversion then is a process which continuously interrogates the master saying, okay, what is, what is the type of coordinate that is desired and what is the coordinate? In this case, it's, it knows it's equatorial and this is the equatorial coordinate and it does the conversion into galactic coordinates and uh, terrestrial coordinates, um, all the other coordinates that are available and puts that back onto the master. So the next step in this case is the position control loop interrogates the master. What is the desired position expressed in accordance that this one understands, which is azimuth and elevation. So it, it never knows, this thing never knows whether the original coordinate is a equatorial or galactic. It just knows azimuth and elevation and gets that from the master. And then the same works back. So the, the position will position, uh, the position control will position the telescope and then feed back the information what the actual position is. Feed that back, that goes onto the master and the coordinate conversion will also convert the actual, uh, the actual, um, the actual position. Now, as you might expect, or as you might understand, if you now use the same thing for a different telescope, the only thing that you need to change is the position control loop, which actually talks to the, um, to the mount, but all the rest is completely ir uh, irrespective of what type of telescope you're using. The coordinate con conversion is always the same. So this helped us a lot because we did this design and when we uh, moved to the smaller telescope, we basically only had to care about this thing. And also there's some GPIO handling, which is specific. And then there's, um, let's say a little bit of a fun part here, uh, which is a gamepad interface. Um, that is part fun, but also part necess necessity. Um, you want to move the telescope manually. And the way we implemented that was there is this um, software module which recognizes if a gamepad is connected. And then uh, we put that into the whole uh, telescope control in what we call a maintenance mode. And then we can actually move the telescope via a little game control. It's very convenient if you stand by the side of the telescope and want to do something uh, for maintenance, then you can use this little thing to move the telescope. So this is the controller software design. Um, we were facing a special challenge um, with this telescope, or to be precise, with the uh, mount or the, the Aegis rotor. Um, the encoder, uh, these quadrature encoder that I mentioned, they count uh, for the elevation, the revolution of a spindle. Now, let me quickly show you the picture again of that. Um, this is the spindle which goes up and down, and this sort of tilts the elevation. And as you can imagine, the rotation of that spindle uh, and the angle is completely non-linear. And there was something that was even worse. Um, if you move it in azimuth, this also counts as a rotation of the spindle. So your elevation changes with azimuth. So it's a real mess. And we said, okay, how do we deal with that? And what we did was um, we measured 
5,000 points in the Altamut and Azimus plane uh, with an electronic inclination sensor attached. So we had a relation between azimuth and L, um, azimuth and elevation setting uh, as a target coordinate and the actual uh, elevation. And that is um, that a lot of data is uh, shown here. It shows also the nonlinearity. And then we made a small model and fitted the model parameters to it. So in this case, now we had an analytic way of converting that. And that is part of, uh, that is embedded in this um, position control loop software. That was a um, bit of work. There's also one thing that you can see, there's sort of a sinusoidal um, bending here. And that is due to the fact that our um, telescope is not standing exactly vertical. There's a slight uh, inclination toward one direction that shows in a sinusoidal uh, change in the elevation. And this model compensates also for that. That was sort of a nice thing which we uh, gained by that. All right, so this was our special challenge with that. Um, on the backend side, uh, I already mentioned that we um, use mostly Ada and Pluto because it's uh, stable, st has a good gain stability, but we also have been using Lime SDR, HackRF, RTL SDR, SDR Plain Air Spy. Also, we had a USRP from Atos Research, which unfortunately uh, died on us, so we didn't use it much. Um, on the software side for the um, analysis um, and to work with the different uh, SDRs, we developed a software that is based on SOPI SDR. SOPI SDR is an abstraction layer, so it, it sort of isolates the um, higher levels of the software from the details of the individual SDR. So we could uh, design a software which is always the same and uses all different types of uh, of the software defined radios. So this is very convenient. If you change this, um, an SDR, you want to use a different SDR, you can still use the same software. You only need to make sure that you have the appropriate uh, SOPI SDR drivers for the individual um, SDRs available. Then there's a separate program um, which does the continuum measurements. Uh, we have decided not to put it all in one. So there's one which does the spectral resolution <clears throat> when we, for example, want to observe hydrogen lines. And then we have a continuum program when we want to use uh, power, total power measurements. Um, what both programs do is they, when they do the recording, they read the pointing information from the telescope control. So in the headers of our uh, data, you always have uh, the exact information about timing, where did the, <clears throat> what was the target name, what is the position that uh, you're looking at. Besides this um, in-house developed software, um, we are using a another program for pulsar observations that's uh, called PSR filter bank that is developed by Marcos Leach and some other people have um, been working on that, um, doing some additions and so on. That is based on GNU radio. So it's a different abstraction layer. Um, here we have SOPI SDR, um, here we have GNU radio. We do not like so much using GNU radio, by the way, because uh, there are always compatibility issues between ver uh, different versions of GNU radio. But in this case, it was something that Marcos has done. Very nice, uh, worked for us very well. So uh, we're very happy to use that. OK, putting all this together, um, what do we get? And what, what is the performance of that telescope? I have shown three examples. Um, let's start with this uh, graph here. This is a hydrogen observation 
of the galactic plane. So what we did is we took a hydrogen spectrum from essentially the galactic center all the way to about 220 degrees of galactic longitude. This is what we can observe from our location. Uh, we can just go to the galactic uh, center. It's not very high above the horizon, but workable. And uh, 220 then is the limit on the other side, which then again is just barely above the horizon. These uh, spectra taken, they were taken in increments of the galactic longitude, if I recall correctly, 0.2 degrees, which of course is narrower than our resolution, but it gives you a very nice, almost continuous uh, represent, representation of the spectrum. Now, the way to interpret this, essentially a spectrum can be considered as a vertical line. So each spectrum really is one vertical line here uh, at one galactic longitude. And depicted here is the velocity of the hydrogen and the color denotes the intensity. So we have very bright uh, hydrogen here and at 180 degrees where all the different uh, arms of the um, of the Milky Way are at the same velocity and then you get another very bright region. So this is a, a nice picture. I should mention that you see a uh, line here. This is a interference. It's a fixed frequency interference, narrow frequency. And the reason why it's bent is because we are doing local standard of rest corrections. So all this is corrected for the local standard of rest. And therefore, obviously, you get a variation here. So what we can say, OK, it works nicely for hydrogen. It is really the main purpose of that instrument. Then on the attempt was made, and fortunately, it was successful uh, to observe the strongest pulsar of the Northern Hemisphere, B0329 plus 54. And um, this is a recording. In this case, we have about uh, a little bit over 50 megahertz of bandwidth. For those of you who are familiar <clears throat> with this type of plot from the Presto uh, software, you can see the by the sort of darker line here, the intensity over the frequency. So this is 1400 megahertz, this is 1440. And this is a similar plot, but this time over time, uh, you can see that it varies a bit in intensity over time, which is typical for a pulsar like that. Um, the observation were about 9,000 seconds. So three hours or so, a little bit less than three hours. And this is the signal from the pulsar. There's another type of plot from the Presto. I won't go into the details of that, but it's sort of supposed where it's supposed to be. So we uh, can observe pulsars with a three meter dish, but I would like to just say a word of caution. It doesn't always work. Um, this pulsar is um, strongly scintillating, which means that it's varying intensity over time. So. You can be lucky, but you can also be out of luck. We have many other observations. Uh, when we did not observe the pulsar, I would say that about maybe 30 to 50% of the trials, we, we get a pulsar signal with that dish. A third example, which shows the capability of a dish of that size, is the observation of a maser. This is a one of the stronger masers, I have to say, an OH masers. These are at 1612 megahertz. Um, the, this one is called NML Cygnus. And um, I don't recall exactly what the integration time was, probably in the order of an hour or so. Um, you see two curves here. Uh, the black is actually the one that was recorded with a three meter dish. And the red one was for the purpose of comparison, because we wanted to make sure are we really seeing uh, the Maser from NML Cygnus, or are we seeing something different? But you see that those curves do nicely overlap. So this is just a, a monitoring uh, thing that we did with our 25 meter dish. Are we really seeing what we, we think we are seeing? Yes. So in other words, um, 
besides hydrogen, which is sort of the easy part, you can also, with the three meter Gs, you can observe uh, the pulsar. Uh, you can also observe OH mazes. And I'll come to uh, another type of observation in the context of, a, of another telescope, which can also be done with this one. OK, so um, this sort of summarizes um, our three meter dish. What are the lessons learned? Uh, we learned that the Aegis rotor is not very rigid. And but we have to admit that the Aegis rotor we are using is not specified for a three meter dish. Uh, it's intended for smaller dishes. <clears throat> so we are using it in a non, non permissible range, I would say. And therefore, we can only use it in low wind conditions. Uh, I talked about the complex dependencies uh, between azimuths and elevation, uh, which has to be taken care of. We learned that the support structure really had, needs to be rigid, otherwise it's sort of bouncing around. SDR-based solutions, as we all know, this is the way to go these days. And we found maybe a little bit out of uh, luck that doing it very modular in the software uh, was very helpful. Uh, we now have five years of operation on this telescope. And the only problems that we had with the was, was with the rotor. We had some corrosion. We had to take it apart at one point in time. But other than that, it's been a pretty reliable instrument if we take care that we don't run into higher wind conditions. This was sort of our first advan adventure with uh, building a smaller telescope. Um, then we. From time-wise, the next one was a 1.2 meter dish. Why did we do that? Um, well, we one of the purpose of the three meter dish is to have schools coming to us and doing experiments and so on. But that's not always possible for a school. So um, we thought, well, why don't we? If the schools can, cannot come to us, why don't we bring the telescope to them? And we know that hydrogen can be seen with a relatively small telescope. Uh, so we put a 1.2 meter dish, again with the same rotor, an Aegis rotor, on a trailer. And uh, the idea then was to make it easier to set up. So we wanted to have the motion control system and the RF section, everything uh, on the trailer. I'll show that in a minute. What we needed to add compared to the other um, telescopes is we have a GPS, which gives us time and location because we are not connected uh, permanently to a network. And we want to just to have a notebook <clears throat> to do the control and observation. So the basic idea was to, sorry, uh, the basic idea was to design it in such a way that when we are arriving at a school, only what we need is to have power. And the rest is all integrated and we have a network connection between the trailer and a notebook. All right, um, again, feed horn. Um, this is a simpler feed horn. It's a co coffee can feed horn. Um, again, the, the, uh, the pattern is shown here. The blue lines denote uh, the rim of the dish. So this one is on, looking on the dish, and this is giving a spillover. Um, we use a simpler um, LNA, these SPF design devices, which are reasonably cheap. Uh, they gave us a noise figure of 0.7 dB. And uh, that was the RF side. If we look on the electronics side, as I said, it's on the trailer. We made two separate uh, cabinets for the controller. The hardware is exactly the same as we use on the three meter dish with the same boards and so on, just a different form factor. And the RF section is here. You see again, a cavity filter here. This is the SDR, again, in this case, an Ada and Pluto. And there's one specialty. In this case, we use a converter from USB to network to connect to the uh, Ada and Pluto. Fortunately, Adam Pluto directly supports one of these de certain de devices. So it was not a big deal to connect it via network rather than via the USB. All right. Um, then you remember that we had this issue with this high complexity thing with the elevation and the quadrature encoders. 
And we used an elevation sensor uh, to actually calibrate that on the three meter dish. And in our 1.2 meter dish, we said, okay, why don't we use an um, inclination sensor directly? Uh, we don't have, a, have to have a high accuracy. It's just a 1.2 meter dish. And that's what we did. Um, we used an ADXL203 sensor. Uh, actually, it's uh, this little device here. And um, this has an analog output in order to get a digital signal or the, the uh, actual uh, angle. We used a Raspberry, oh no, sorry, an Ardu a small Arduino, Arduino Mini or Arduino Micro, one of these, to do the A to D conversion and to, and to uh, convert that into actual have the calibration data and convert it into actual angle. Uh, I should mention um, the ADXL203 uh, is not the cheapest one from the inclination sensors that are available. There are many low cost sensors which also ha already have a digital output, but these are not temperature stable. We tested them and we were not satisfied with them. So we, we went for the more expensive solution. Again, uh, let's take some observation examples. Um, the same story, what I have explained. Um, this again is the hydrogen in the galactic plane, this time done with a 1.2 meter dish, some RFI again here. And this is another uh, type of measurement. It's a continuum measurement. It's a scan of the sun. So this is just the intensity as we move uh, over the sun. You can see side lobes here to the left and to the right as expected. Uh, side lobes are not bad, but they're there. So this is the uh, what we can do with a 1.2 meter dish. We cannot do pulsars. We cannot do mesas. So we, this one is really constrained to hydrogen observation, which is the main purpose. and some limited continuum observation. Just for comparison, um, to see what is the difference uh, between the 1.2 meter dish and the three meter dish for the same type of experiment when you do the um, scan of the galactic plane. As you expect, it's the same, but the resolution is different. You can see more structure in here, uh, which you don't see here. Um, also, you, you lose a bit out here. Overall, um, the Milky Way, uh, the galactic plane can be seen nicely with a 1.2 meter dish. You can do all these experiments like looking at the rotation curve and so on. And uh, you're, you're lacking some resolution if you want to dig deeper. But it is a very capable instrument uh, at the size of 1.2 meter to do hydrogen observation. And as we see with many other small instruments like the scope in the box and others, uh, small dishes are very, very capable with, um, with, the of, with the observation of hydrogen. So um, in summary, uh, what is different? Um, we use a different LNA, less expensive ones or less capable ones, and the feed horn is more simple. Um, a Kumar feed would have shadowed too much of the dish, of the small dish. We did the elevation control via an inclination sensor. Um, the SDR is uh, actually direct integrated into the trailer and connected via TCP IP. And we have an additional GPS to get position and time. We, you have, we have the same rotor, uh, the Aegis rotor. Um, for 1.2 meter, that's perfectly fine. There, there's no issues with uh, being too wind sensitive and so on. It's, uh, that's really uh, doing a great job there. Um, the controller hard and software, um, it's exactly the same as on the three meter dish with some main, minor adaptions for the inclination sensor rather than the, the quadrature encoders. And of course, the receiving chain with SDR is different because of the TCP connection. But other than that, it is a, Essentially was rebuilding our three meter dish with a slightly different uh, things. Um, just as a final picture here, this is the transport con configuration. We don't keep the dish up here uh, because if we're driving uh, longer distances, 
the wind may be a bit, uh, the wind pressure may be a bit difficult. So we put it down. There are some fixtures there to fix the, di uh, the dish. Okay, um, 2.3 meter dish. Again, there, there was a starting point. Um, we were offered to take over an old SRT um, by a university down in southern part of Germany. And it was uh, one of these SRTs that were designed by MIT and they were manufactured at some point in time, they were managed, manufactured by a company called Cassie. These type of um, devices of telescopes have been sold in, I think, quite substantial quantities. They are not manufactured anymore. And um, the offer was that we could take it uh, from there. Uh, they had bought a new one from another company and uh, yeah, we could have it. So we, we scratched our heads and said, okay, do we really need yet another dish? But then the decision was taken, yes, um, let's take it because eventually we can combine it with our three meter dish into an interferometer. So we took it. Um, it was clear that the electronics and the receiving chain, while they were good at the time when they were built and, and designed, but they were no longer state of the art. Um, so we said, okay, let's uh, just uh, see what we can use from our existing design. Um, and then just reuse the dish, reuse the feed horn and all the mechanical parts, let's, but let's build a new controller and let's do um, a new receiving chain, just like, like we did before. So that was the approach. Um, the setup in this case, uh, this is a steel pole, which is also attached to the building and, and uh, down here it's in concrete. The outside electronics, very similar to the three meter dish is close by, but this in this case in a wall mounted cabinet. And again, you will see the same uh, thing here. This is again our electronics uh, for the controller or the controller itself, uh, which drives the motors of the azimuth and elevation. In this case, elevation is done by this rod, and there's a separate unit for the azimuth. So we did not have a angular encoder or a quadrature encoder uh, for the elevation. So we choose to go for a inclination sensor again. Uh, coming back to the cabinet, um, in this case, we have integrated the electronics here. Uh, the LNA, of course, is up at the feed horn, but some post amplification is done here. Uh, again, you can see a cavity filter, but essentially we play around with that a bit. So sometimes we use a cavity filter, sometimes we use something different. We left some room here, so that's sort of our playground for playing around with the RF. Um, one of the things that we needed to decide was uh, what are we going to do uh, with a feed horn? Because the feed horn um, that came with it was a really a strange thing. It was a C-band feed horn that had been modified with an additional outer ring. Uh, so there was an additional outer ring here. And there was an off-axis probe uh, for the L-band and the center probe was just, uh, yeah, left unconnected. We were very concerned that that would give us any good results, but we measured it and it wasn't, it wasn't great, but um, it was good enough. We said, okay, let's for the time being just use the existing feed horn and see what we can get out of it. Um, the LNA again was the same uh, thing, dual SPF, like we have on our 1.2 meter dish. And then we do some post amplification with an OLEC saw bird. So if we go here, those are the saw birds which do the post amplification. All right. Um, the Mechanics, um, the rotor uh, that does the asimus and also the this linear actuator, they are very, very rigid. I mean, these are really heavy things. Um, so no complaints there. They have a little bit of slack and so on. 
Um, what we did though, was that we added some electronics uh, here so that we get feedback um, from the end switches. Um, the original design, there were end switches, but you didn't have any notification, any feedback that you could put on a computer. I already mentioned um, the elevation is via this linear actuator. And we did again an inclination sensor it's shown here. This is our inclination sensor for measuring the elevation. The, uh, as I mentioned, the electronics is again the same. Um, with this uh, setup that we have, uh, we have a system temperature of 120 Kelvin. Aperture efficiency was measured to be 50%. Again, our nice uh, little plot of the hydrogen in the galactic plane, same, same story again. And again, we were able to observe the pulsar with this 2.3 meter dish, which is shown here. Um, this is a, an example of a continuum observation, which I haven't shown for the three meter dish. So this is a transit scan of the Cygnus complex, which is the brightest um, because of the combination of Cygnus A and Cygnus X, it becomes the brightest source besides the sun it can nicely be seen as it's passing through at the right, at the correct right ascension. So again, um, Primarily the purpose of this instrument is hydrogen observations when we do lab courses, but uh, we have also done some first uh, experiments with using as, as an interferometer jointly with a three with a three meter dish. So again, uh, what is different? Uh, there are again different LNA, but the same as on the 1.2 meter dish. It's kind of strange feed horn. Um, Elevation control is via inclination sensor because it proved to be a very workable solution for the 1.2. It's a different rotor. Uh, we had to complement that rotor, by the way, for the azimuths uh, with a quadratru encoder. We added in the quadratru encoder there. But again, the same is the hardened for software of um, the controller, just some minor adaptations in the software. And we have the same receiving chain with SDRs and, and the software that goes with it. Okay, let's go on to one more um, dish and talk about the starting point. Uh, similar to the previous one, um, there was a SRT base, so essentially the same thing that we have just talked about, which had again become redundant in this case from the University of Hamburg. And at that time, at that time, the University of Bonn, um, they would like to have a small radio telescope for undergraduate lab courses. And since we knew that that was redundant in Hamburg, we suggested to them to approach them, say, OK, uh, can Hamburg donate that to the University of Bonn? And they agreed. So <clears throat> uh, people from Bonn University went there and uh, picked it up from Hamburg, brought it to Bonn. And we inspected it. And it, it, it was exactly the same design as our 2.3 meter dish, only it had a bigger dish. That was the only difference, uh, 3.2 instead of 2.3. So we could really replicate what we had done on the 2.3 meter dish. And that's, this was done. Um, we did that with a group of, group of students. Um, we asked who would be interested and so they, came together at the university at the time, still under Corona regulations with a mask on, and uh, they had fun building it. They learned uh, soldering, they learned uh, mess around with gears, get their fingers dirty on, uh, on the mechanics and so on, paint, do put new paints on and so on. That was a fun exercise with these students. Um, the feed horn in this case, we didn't reuse the old feed horn. Um, there was a new feed horn built. You may notice that this is a fairly long feed horn. There's a reason for that. Um, the telescope um, is now on the rooftop of the Astronomy Institute of the University of Bonn. And this has, is a, it's in a, in a downtown area and it has visibility of all the nice mobile uh, base stations around. And we want to have a long feed horn because that suppresses then the 800 megahertz mobile band very well. It's below the cutoff frequency 
and um, you get better attenuation if the uh, feed horn is a bit longer. We may have exaggerated a bit, but it doesn't hurt. Um, in this case, we use the Norlex Sawbird as LNA. This is, by the way, our uh, feed pattern of the feed horn. Um, there's something strange, which I'll come to it in a little moment. Um, the outdoor cabinet is just a replication you will recognize. That's the same what we did at our site, um, same design, the same components and so on, exactly the same. And this is the dish, how it is set up on the roof. Um, it's 3.2 meter. It has been repainted from black to white. And the gentleman who is depicted, depicted here is the astronomer Agalanda, famous in Bonn. He did the survey, the Bonn survey back. I don't know exactly when, but he is also gave the name to the Institute, Agalanda Institute. So again, this uh, basically was a replication with practically little changes uh, to what we uh, did on our 2.3 meter dish because it's essentially the same mechanics, same electronics, and it was a fun exercise doing it with students. Some first results, uh, the system temperature is 100 uh, Kelvin. Originally, we measured an aperture efficiency of 32%, which is too low. In, in the meantime, I briefly cover that. We know why that is, and it has to be improved. In the meantime, after I made the slides for the conference, uh, uh, we found out what the reason is. Uh, at the moment, the full characterization is um, performed right now by a student uh, who is working on his bachelor thesis to do that. So this is just a brief uh, picture of our first light from the S7 calibration region of uh, that you see the hydrogen spectrum there. Okay, um, final telescope. This is a somewhat different story. Um, it started um, the US, University of Rheinwald, which is some 80 kilometers or 50 kilometers from our site, they had purchased a commercial radio telescope um, called Spider 230 from a company which is uh, now called, they call themselves Radio to Space. Um, uh, they had the parent company is Prima Luce Labs uh, from Italy. They purchased it with the intention to use it for lab courses. Uh, but they were really unable to make proper use of it. They said, well, we, we have troubles with it and we, we really don't know how to use it. And um, we said, okay, why don't we do the following? Uh, bring it over to our site and uh, we look at it, what's, what's the problem? Uh, we'll review it and see what can be done with it. And uh, so all of a sudden we had another telescope on our site, which we had a deal with. We looked at everything and said, what, what, is, what is the problem with this telescope? Where, where does it, uh, why, why are the people in the university having problems with it? Okay, we found out that the dish itself, it's a 2.3 meter dish, no problems with that. The feed horn, um, it's a, relatively straightforward feed horn, uh, coffee can type. Um, only what is different is circular polarized, so it has a septum feed. Um, it has excellent LNAs uh, made by the company Kuna. Um, we tested those LNAs, and as expected, they were perfectly fine within specification, and the specification is good. We found that, um, I, I should mention that dish, uh, I mean, switch back. You can see, oops, you can see it's a commercial equatorial mount. It's an EQ8 mount, which is an optical mount, certainly a very good mount, but not very well uh, suited for a radio telescope because of the size of the dish and the counterweight and so on. You have many situations where either the dish or the uh, counterweight collides with the mount. Also, uh, that is not weatherproof. It is sensitive to wind. Uh, we found it had insufficient counterweight. So there are some mechanical issues overall with using an AQ8 uh, 
equatorial mount. But the really problem was with the receiver design. I mean, uh, we looked at it and it's simply not state of the art. And, uh, and even worse, it had many flaws. Um, what we found is that, um, first of all, to do hydrogen, it just ha didn't have enough spectral resolution. And it has significant frequency errors. We have made a measurement saying, OK, this is the frequency. And this is the offset that you get. You're in the range of. Uh, 350 ppm, which is uh, equivalent to about 200 kilometer per second. So if you try to make a measurement of hydrogen, you just don't get the right answer. And the software is unstable, uh, had many errors and so on. And this is also the main reason why the university couldn't make good use of it. So how do you uh, move forward from that? Um, as I said, the dish itself, feed horn LA fine. Um, just discard the receiver and the software uh, and use SDR solutions like what we have. Um, we can use our software package then. The mount, you cannot do much about it. Uh, you just have to live with the limitations. So what we had to do is um, we had to develop a driver for the EQ8 mount. So it would work with our control software. Um, we thought about what is the best way of doing it, discussing back and forth. But finally, we decide just using the uh, Siri communication protocol that the EQ8 controller understands. The impact then on the software, this is sort of our original software. And now the power of this design is that we really had to just replace the position control rule by a uh, new module that you have written. This is the Syncan serial interface, which uh, controls the telescope. Uh, we don't have any GPIO handling in this case. Uh, and the um, gamepad didn't make sense in that circumstances. So these were left out. But essentially, this is the same software structure with just one module modified. Um, the guys at Ryan Wahl, they uh, built the receiver section um, relatively straightforward. Um, you have the input from the LNA coming in here. In this case, the LNA is powered by a BIOS T set here. Then there's again the famous cavity filter design from uh, Matthias Wittmar and an RM Pluto as an SDR and USB out. So this is the receiver. Same design as we use in the other at the other telescopes. Some observation exam examples again. Um, we have a system, system temperature of 90 Kelvin. We have an aperture efficiency of 62. That's perfectly fine. Um, this is a uh, again an example of a hydrogen spectrum. But um, just to show you where the problem with their receiver is. Um, this is the spectrum that we're taking with their receiver of the same sky location. So it's just incomplete, uh, completely unusable because it doesn't have the necessary resolution. It has some zigzagging on the background, no idea where it comes from. It's intrinsic to the receiver. And as you can see, the velocity is completely off. I mean, the, the main peak is at zero kilometer per second. And this is about at 100 kilometer per second. So this is really where the problem with this commercial telescope is. Um, a transit of this sun shows little, uh, only very little side lobes. So this is really looking good. All right. Um, summary for that one. Um, the telescope as shipped from the supplier has some deficits, as we pointed out, mainly in the receiver and the software. Uh, the dish itself, no problem with that. Uh, LNA, good um, good quality product from Kuna, that works fine. But what you can do is you just discard the um, receiver and do an SDR solution like everybody else is doing these days, and then you're you're good to go with that dish as well. Putting aside some of the problems with the AQ8 mount. All right, let's come up and wrap up. Um, we have five dishes of various sizes uh, at different locations. They, uh, we have two times an Aegis rotor, two times the SRT uh, CASI motor, and in one case, an AQ8. 
Um, we use incremental encoders uh, for the azimuth in, with the exception of the, uh, well, actually the EQ8 has an, also an incremental encoder internally. So uh, yes, we, we just don't talk directly to them just through the EQ8 interface. Um, on three of the dishes, we use an inclination sensor rather than um, an incremental encoder. The motor controller um, works very well for us for all for different motors and so on, but uh, they work very well for us. The MD49 for the um, 2.3 meter dish with the equatorial mount, of course, that's an integrated thing. The feeds are different all over the place. We have a Kumar type feed. We have this very special funny thing uh, on the 2.3 meter dish. And uh, then we have coffee can two times, but one is dual circular rather than dual linear. And uh, on the 3.2 meter dish, we have a Kumar with also dual linear pickups. Um, LNAs. Um, the TQP uh, one from uh, these days, Corvo works fine. Then we use uh, also the SPF, um, reasonably noise figure. Also the Sawbird, which is quite common these days is fine. Kuna LNA uh, is excellent, uh, costs a bit of money though. As far as filters concerned, we are really, um, a fan of the cavity filter that is designed by Matyats, but of course the saw filter from, which is used in the uh, saw bird is, is fine as well. Um, so we, we use both. Backend software, SDR is essentially uh, mostly Alada and Pluto. Um, we change a bit back and forth on our uh, three and 2.3 meter dish. The position control software is really common among, among all these um, instruments with minor modifications here and there is a mo module modified or uh, in one case, a module um, is, is a bit, uh, is a different module. So the adaptation from the three meter dish is um, the inclination sensor support typically. And of course, the AQ8 interface that I talked about. On most of these, we support the gamepad, our little fun thing. Spectrometer software is always the same, and the continuum uh, software is always the same. So it's a sort of a chain of uh, five instruments which have many, many things in common, even though they're physically quite different. Performance uh, um, the beam with our is within what you expect from a, from a dish of that size. Uh, that's expected. Um, we have a little bit of a problem with the um, system temperature on our 1.2 meter dish. We still have to find out what's, what's going on there. And uh, we have some inconsistencies in some other measurements. So that's, uh, this is why I left it at 2 TBD. Other than that, um, the um, system temperatures are not great, but they are okay. The aperture efficiency, um, let me just briefly, this is within expected. Again, here we have a measurement problem, 2.3 meter dish looking fine. And here on the 3.2 meter dish, we had this very low aperture efficiency. Uh, what we found out in the meantime is that was due to heavy side lobes. And we have, which was a surprise to us, uh, we have taken the choke ring off the Kumar feed. We're just using a different, uh, a, a simple coffee can feed now. <clears throat> and all of a sudden we have good side lobes and an aperture efficiency of 65%. We don't quite understand why that is the case, why we're getting these heavy side lobes with the uh, with the choke rings. Um, but we have to take it as an experimental fact and find out why that is. I've listed some other numbers. Um, the gain expressed in Kelvin per Jansky, that is how much antenna change in antenna temperature do we get per Jansky of, uh, of received power. Um, the system equivalent flux density is how much Jansky do I need to get the same power as for my, as for my system temperature. Um, 
these two numbers have to be re revisited, uh, these, these two here, because of the different um, aperture efficiency. So these will get better with a better um, aperture efficiency. But overall, um, they are not the absolute greatest instruments. There's room for improvement here and there, but they are quite good. Um, they're, they, they're built mainly for the purpose of hydrogen. That's what they easily can do, and they can do some more things. OK, what's my conclusion? Um, I, the conclusion is telescopes in that range, one to three meter, will work very well for the 21 centimeter line. And that's not big news. I mean, that's what people here uh, in the auditorium have all experienced. Um, pulsars and OH masers are in the realm of possibilities uh, for the larger of the dishes. Uh, we can see a limited number of continuum sources. I've only briefly addressed one, but they are a few more. Um, my recommendation would be if anyone from anywhere can get uh, his fingers on one of these old XMIT SRTs, go and go after it because they, it's very difficult these days to get a good mount. And these mounts, they have a bit of slack, uh, but they're really, really tough. Uh, just to give you an example, a 2.3 meter dish was sitting in, not in stall position, just sitting there and it, we had 100 kilometers of wind. It was just standing there. And we can move it around at 80 kilometers uh, per hour wind. So um, if somebody has uh, somewhere lying around these SRT drives, um, the one by, made by CASI, very doable. <clears throat> we were lucky with the modularity of our control software, so we could really do it. This may not be really something for uh, a wider audience, because typically you would only buy, uh, build one, um, uh, one dish. And of course, no big news. SDRs are just the way to go for a receiver. OK, that's all I have to say about those five dishes. Um, and I'm happy to take questions. I would like to know on the cavity filters, if you build them locally, or do you purchase them from the fellow that designed them? No, we, we just made them locally. Um, we, you, you just buy um, a standard profile. Let me just go back and see where we can see them. I think I had one slide where you can see that best. Um, and Wolfgang, one um, interruption here and apologies. Uh, we're going to have to take our lunch break at Green yep, Bank yep. right now. Um, we'll leave the uh, Zoom link open and let you continue to collaborate and take questions. Um, but we have our keynote speaker one hour from now and our folks uh, need to walk to a cafeteria for lunch. So, okay. Uh, so those who would prefer to stay and um, participate in the round table are welcome to do that in the auditorium. Um, and I thank you so very much. Uh, this afternoon during administrative announcements, uh, Wolfgang, I will uh, uh, talk about your announcement about UCARA. So thank yep. you so okay. very much. Wonderful presentation. Thanks very much. Okay. Um, I guess the, uh, the, the question was um, from, from online. Uh, so let me respond to that. I, I've shown now a picture of two variants of that cavity filter. So what you do... Um, you just, this is a standard aluminum profile. Um, it's a hollow uh, rectangular profile. And then you put a screw in there. Um, in this case, it's a three pole filter. So there are three aluminum rods. Uh, again, a standard material, eight millimeters. So you can just buy that, cut it to length, buy, make the same thing with the. Um, with the aluminum rods, cut them to length and screw them in at the right position. Um, I, I have uh, written a paper sometime back on our three meter dish in the Zara journal where I give some more details on the cavity filter. There's also some more, more pictures, but they can easily be built. Thank you. Um. I have a question on uh, 
uh, your opinion of uh, uh, mounts, specifically uh, uh, alt, uh, altitude uh, and uh, azimuth and elevation mounts versus the uh, uh, the thing that uh, uh, optical astronomers use, uh, it, 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 like the German equatorial mounts. Uh, and, uh, and and their this their structural strength and things like that. Yeah, the the only hands on experience that we have with um, equatorial mounts is this EQ eight mount uh, that we have seen on the this commercial telescope. Um, that we found two issues, um, or maybe three issues. Uh, issue number one, um, the physical dimensions of the uh, dish are much bigger than from a telescope, from an optical telescope, I should say. So when you move it around, um, there are many pl places where the uh, dish might hit the mount because of the kind that it moves. It can also move, uh, touch the ground and so on. So you have to be uh, fairly careful. Uh, the second point is um, optical mounts are not designed to be in the outside at any weather, because then you cannot observe. So you typically have them in some sheltered environment and there's no need to have them weatherproof. Uh, and radio telescope, at least our position is we rather would like to leave it all the time outside and uh, let it sit in the weather. And this is not doable with optical uh, mounts. Um, another thing is maybe, um, the the uh, the optical mounts are typically specified for a weight maximum weight, and that's no issue at all. Uh, but what they don't specify, where you run into issues, is torque, because of the larger dimensions. Um, your limiting factor is not the weight. I mean, the dishes are not heavy, but then you have. Uh, a, a longer arm with a um, feet on it and so on. So we have quite some torque. And we found, for example, the EQ8, which is specified easily to carry the weight of that uh, dish, but it didn't have enough torque to actually move it without counterweights. Um, then um, the, the precision uh, of the the optical mounts is typically much, much better than what you would need for radio astronomy. Your, your opening angle is much, much bigger than for optical telescopes. So you do, don't need that accuracy. Um, so in, in, in conclusion, I would say uh, for some, let's say, experiments to get your uh, feet wet and so on, uh, using an equatorial mount for radio astronomy is quite doable. I mean, we've seen many examples um, where people do that also quite successfully, but you have to be aware about the limitations. Um, another uh, comment may be, um, what are the options for azimuth elevation mounts uh, suited for radio astronomy? And there are not that many. I mentioned the Aegis rotor. This, that one has certainly restrictions as far as the size of uh, dishes is concerned. We are using it in a, let's say, non-authorized way by putting too much load on it. Unfortunately, the one that I mentioned, this um, CASI mount, uh, is no longer available. So you can only find it at some junkyard or steal it from somewhere. Or I don't know. Uh, I am aware of a. Um, mount that I think is made, designed and made by a Polish company that is sold among other sources uh, by um, RFM design from the Netherlands, but probably they also have other uh, things where they sell it. I don't have any hands-on experience with that. I've seen it. I have uh, also seen it at a university. So, um, I'm, uh, unfortunately, I, I didn't get my hands on it yet. Um, I think that this would be a, a uh, from, from looking at the specification and so on, I think that this would be an option. The only caveat that I would have with that is uh, long-term water tightness. 
I noted that they are using motors. Uh, maybe actually I can show that. Uh, they're using the same type of motors that is actually in the, oops, I need to find it. Yeah, uh, oops, this is um, a picture of the, uh, the Casi roto, roto unit. <clears throat> and this is a standard type of motor, runs typically with 24 volts. <clears throat> and this is a type of motor that is used in, um, sometimes in cars for windshield wipers and other applications is for um, electric motion of your garage door. I think this is the most common application. <clears throat> and if you look at the specification of these, they are uh, not intended for being exposed to uh, rain. So the IP specification is um, that you should not permanently use it in pouring rain. And this may for, um, I, I don't know whether this company has made some extra protection, uh, some extra ceilings and whatnot, but this would be my only concern there. Other than I haven't, I haven't had my hands on it and were able to test it. Thank you. Okay, any, any further questions? Uh, Wolfgang, uh, have you had any particular problems with surge uh, lightning EMP kind of problems with all the networking uh, and USB ports? Fortunately not. Um, I have to say though, we do have lightning, but not uh, so frequent, not so heavy as in some other um, areas. We, uh, one of our concern always is also a 25 meter dish, uh, which uh, we operate for more than 10 years now. We don't have, we did not have any lightning damage so far. Keep our fingers crossed. As far as <clears throat> um, USB is concerned, we do have one issue with a USB um, and Accidentally, I have the right uh, slide open. You can see our inclination sensor. And <clears throat> this inclination sensor has a small um, Arduino in it. And what we found uh, is that the USB line uh, from that inclination sensor uh, down there gives us RFI. Uh, we had the same design on our 1.2 meter dish where we didn't notice any problem. So we used that design also on a 2.3 meter dish and there we saw interference and it was basically USB. Um, therefore for the Bonn University where we have essentially the same type of drive, we made a change that is that the signal from the inclination sensor is not digitized here. We bring it down analog and then digitize it afterwards. So USB and R, uh, USB slash RFI is something that we uh, encountered and we really want, we haven't done it yet, but we want to change that to analog. Okay, thanks. Well, okay. yeah, that cable is behind the dish but you're still getting RFI. Yes, um, we're still getting RFI. That may be attributed to, if you look at this page, uh, that's a slide. We are bringing down the cable. It's behind the dish, but the cable runs down here. And whatever the, the, uh, the path is, um, we do maybe some scattering and so on, but we, we definitely do see it. In the picture you're show, yes. In the picture you're showing now, that's a pretty long USB cable. Yeah, it's um, five meter or so, I would guess, maybe four, that range. We don't have a problem with the USB transmission over that cable uh, itself, but we do see a interference coming from it. I'm thinking the traffic on that USB just to a sensor isn't much as opposed to talking to a 
SDR receiver at the end of a USB. So yeah, it's understand. it's not it's not much traffic. It's uh, I don't know exactly. Don't recall, but we uh, probably not more than ten transmission per seconds, if at, if at most. It's just transferring the actual inclination data. If I may, uh, I want to talk about the the feed itself. You call it calf, coffee can. I call it a cantenna. Um, how do you suggest we make those things? Uh, certainly, you can use galvanized steel from um, moving air around in your house or something. Uh, you could get fancy with welding aluminum, which is beyond my capability. Uh, do you have suggestions? Alex did a nice job of kind of extending a deep pie. Yeah. Uh, dish. Okay. Um, the way we make these is really, really very easy. <laughs> and um, these um, uh, tubes, uh, these are standard stovepipe tubes. Uh, they come in different lengths. We typically take a 25 meters or so relatively short one. And they just happen to have a diameter of 15 centimeter, which works fine for the wavelength. Now, <clears throat> we are in the European environment, but I think if I, if I remember correctly, I had looked it up that stovepipes are available in the US at a very similar diameter. Okay. Uh, and what is the material made of then? It's aluminized steel. So it's, I don't uh, think I've ever heard that sentence before. Aluminized uh, steel. Neat. Yeah. Um, they they called it FAL, which stands for uh, Feuer Aluminisiert. That would be translated fire aluminized steel. And that is uh, a material that, <clears throat> yeah, it's steel. Uh, and it gets its corrosion protection by obviously a very thin layer of aluminum. And Which is conductive uh, enough and uh, protects it from the environment. Yeah, so I mean, um, that's uh, the, the one that I'm showing here uh, on that picture is sitting out all the time in the, uh, in the open and it doesn't show any corrosion. Uh, just to, to finish it off, of course, you need to have a lid at the end. And fortunately, again, there's something which is sold um, that exactly fits that. It also, it's also uh, in that product range of uh, stovepipe equipment. So we can actually buy this uh, and then buy the lid and just put the lid on there and then put the, uh, um, you can't quite see it because of the LNA, there's an end connector and we, we drill a hole for the end connector, and then we have a pin uh, at the correct length uh, going into, the, uh, into this uh, horn. And um, yeah, I mean, just uh, this Sunday, we just made another one. And it took, we, we had the parts, and it takes about half an hour, and you're done. Very good. I will look for aluminized steel. That's mag yeah. magical. Yeah, um, maybe. This, maybe comes uh, up, this, this now raises two questions for me, uh, but you, you continue first. Yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm saying just uh, it doesn't may not have to be aluminized. There may be some other corrosion protection, which is more readily available. Um, anything that is conductive or even non-conductive. I mean, even if you would, if there would be a thin layer of paint, uh, I don't think it would hurt. I don't think paint would hurt, but what you do need is conductivity underneath. I'm a little yeah. worried about using galvanized steel, which is what I guess I'm familiar with. Well, <clears throat> galvanized, <clears throat> sorry. Galvanized steel is what we were using on this feed. It, it, and it did work. I mean, this can be soldered. Um, <clears throat> in this case, we really went to the effort of building everything itself, uh, ourselves. This is, let's say, a little bit more optimized. We, we thought at the time for the diameter, it's a little bit smaller than uh, the uh, 15 centimeter, but the 15 centimeter just works fine. Let me go back to 
that one. <clears throat> right, and that just changes the cutoff frequencies on on top or bottom. Sure. Yeah, yeah, it changes the cutoff frequencies. The reason why we made it a bit a little bit smaller because we want to have a little bit more leeway to the uh, upper cutoff frequency for the 1600 megahertz for the OH uh, line. That that was the purpose why we made it a little bit smaller. Uh, but uh, so so I'm just speaking without education. I'm but I'm concerned about galvanized steel just rusting. I would think a a thin layer of rust would uh, <clears throat> be a poor conductor. Yeah, a thin layer of rust would be certainly a poor conductor. But then again, um, this is this feed horn is from galvanized steel, and this one has been sitting out in the environment all the time for six years, and we haven't seen any degradation. We don't physically really see any uh, major corrosion. I think um, one of our guys who, who made this he probably took good care that where he had cut that that he completely covered it with, when soldering with solder maybe otherwise that would be rust but then again it would be on the outside which is not so much of a concern exactly okay well that leads to the second question too uh we might have insects come uh, use that for a very nice home it's all protected it's usually pointing down um, what could we put in there for a cork that would not interfere with the uh, transmission of the emissions coming in? Um, you could cover the opening of the um, of the feet of the mouth of the feet horn with a uh, probably quite a number of different plastic uh, lids. What you can try. Uh, to check whether that plastic is good enough, has a good enough tr a transparency, is to put that into a microwave oven and turn the microwave oven on for a, a minute or two. Yeah, with and a cup of water in the microwave so you don't hurt that. But Yeah, uh, yeah, you, you want to be careful. Whether the not... plastic remains warm, if it's warm, then it's absorbing energy. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> you can easily check that if it's absorbing by seeing whether it gets a... <clears throat> a significant amount of temperature rise. I did that with some PVC pipe one time just to make sure. Yes. Mm, yeah. I think oh, that's okay. that's a fair method to do that. Um, were you able to get that aluminized material also in the long length? Because we have an, uh, an RFI rich environment. Yeah, <clears throat> that that comes in different lengths. Uh, it, uh, we typically buy it as as 25 meter uh, 25 centimeter centimeters it also comes in 40 or 50 in one meter they they come in different lengths the probe is perfectly positioned against the uh, closed end uh to be a certain distance i understand that concept but the open end <clears throat> i don't think is uh too important so the length of the tube uh, as long as it's long enough to make a resonant cavity, uh, could be slightly longer? Yes. <clears throat> I think the, the length of the cavity, uh, the, the tube, is relatively immaterial. Um, I mentioned that we had chosen, uh, let me see. We had chosen, yes, in this case, a, a, a fairly long one. Um, because of the concern, um, well, let, let's say, first of all, the, the cutoff frequency to the lower um, end of the spectrum is relatively sharp anyway, even, even with a shorter. But we want it to be really on the safe side and say, okay, let's make it longer. It doesn't hurt typically, um, but it makes the cutoff um, even deeper. Uh, so we... In a case, we did not have any issues with uh, interference from 800 megahertz in this case. Um, there's there's one thing um, which we are actually struggling with at the moment. Um, we made this this long feed horn. We measured the um, the pattern of the horn uh, as shown here, and it all looked good. 
I mean, this, this is a pattern, uh, not absolute ideal, but within expected ranges, what you uh, expect from a Kumar feed. The strange thing was uh, that we had this poor aperture efficiency. And then we made a scan uh, of the sun and saw heavy, heavy side lobes. <clears throat> and this is not expected behavior. Uh, and as, as a test, we just removed this, uh, uh, this uh, choke ring, and everything was fine uh, with the side lobes, and the uh, aperture efficiency went up significantly. Um, this is unexpected, and um, we need to do some more investigation why that is the case. That's something that is really unexpected. The, the only um, curve or the only warning sign that we already got from that was when we adjusted the uh, choke ring for the for an optimum pattern the surprising thing was that the choke ring was further out than you would normally expect it was actually protruding beyond the uh, opening mouth of the of the uh, cavity feet horn or the, the inner tube which is not what you expect so the, there's um, the question that I have at the moment is, is this unexpected behavior something because the feed horn is so long? That I don't know. Oh, I see. Okay. So that's, that's this area. Of, yeah, I see. Uh, now, I, a, I'm thinking just a longer tube is just a longer waveguide, right? That was, uh, that's what I think also. And, and I have no, uh, um, I have no, I've not read anything that a longer feed horn would modify the pattern and we have measured the pattern, uh, but still it didn't, didn't give us the performance that we expected. And we just took uh, the choke ring off and, and uh, we were okay. Um, <clears throat> so it, it looks, uh, let's put it this way. There seems to be some more magic with feed horns than you might initially think. But um, on the other hand, with the exception of this feed horn, the other ones have worked fine for us. Uh, probably there's I'm looking room at for your plot. It's interesting that the green is not quite symmetrical too. So fascinating. Yep. Um, how did you come up with that plot? I could think that you uh, you almost have a test range there, and you could tilt the dish as you wish in azimuth. Yes, the, what we uh, did, we were using our. Uh, 1.2 uh, meter uh, telescope for that purpose. We, we just took the dish off and um, used the azimuth drive uh, to rotate the feed horn. And then we had a, a little, um, yeah, little antenna, essentially a monopole, uh, placed in front of it at the same distance as the dish. We, we did not measure the far field uh, pattern. We measured the feet, uh, the, the uh, field pattern as it is at the distance of the dish. So this was just the feed horn without any dish? Yeah, that's just the feed horn because okay. we want to make yeah. sure that we adjust it in such a way that we adjust the, the, um, the uh, choke ring in such a way that we get the right pattern here. Um, the mm, the pattern changes relatively sensitive with the position of the choke ring, and that's why is the reason why we do that. So we say, okay, let's put the choke ring in a uh, theoretical position, then measure the <clears throat> the pattern, then uh, move it a bit, and measure the pattern again, see what is the optimum. Oh, so the we, mysteries of antennas. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, we, so um, we, we actually rotate the, the feed horn. When I'm looking at the picture you have there, behind the blue shirt, I see three supports, um, almost as if there's a missing fourth one. Is that correct? Um, there is a missing fourth one, yes. Uh, while it was mounted there, um, there is, uh, <clears throat> for some mechanical reason, the fourth feed support was not mounted yet. Uh, oh, I not think yet. Okay. Uh, I think it can also uh, be seen see here, three. three, and the fourth over here is still missing. Oh, okay. I, I would stay with the three, but okay, good. Uh, I'm yeah, just looking the, for little tricks. Yeah, it's it's asymmetrical at the moment. Um, and uh, 
And so are you worried about uh, side lobes and things? No, it's not. I, I don't think it's modified. side lobes that, that would affect it, but just the, um, because it's a long feed horn, it's sticking out relatively far. So the torque is quite high and you need to make sure that it does, that it is, that the feed horn is really looking at the center of the dish, not looking, uh, not squinting. You have to avoid squinting of the, of the feed horn. Very good. Can I ask I'm looking your, at all these new designs. Go ahead, Bob. On your choke ring there, does it have uh, just one ring or is it more than one one ring around the mouth of the dish? It's just one. It's a Kumar type feet. It's not a Chaparral feet. It's a Kumar feet. Okay. Yeah. And so when you say adjusting it, you mean adjusting the height of the choke ring? Yeah, the uh, position, yeah. essentially. Uh, so that means sliding it up and down. Sli sliding, sliding it up and down in that direction. Okay. Uh, could you comment uh, on uh, extraneous noise? In other words, uh, you know, uh, stuff stuff that's uh, going on around and how far away your uh, facility is from uh, uh, major noise, uh, QRN. Yeah, essentially, we have to live with what is around. Um, we are in, in, in different environments for the telescopes. Um, the uh, Starting with our own site, um, we have the typical amount of electronics there, computers and so on. We try to uh, be sufficiently distanced from the building where the, that stuff is. Um, we can't quite avoid that. Uh, let me see. Yeah. Um, so this is our 2.3 meter dish. Uh, it's about 10 meter from the nearest building. And one of the, uh, there are two RFI issues that we have in that particular case. Uh, one I have already mentioned, that's our USB cable, which we need to replace. Um, the other um, problem that we have is a camera. Uh, uh, really a professional camera that's uh, nearby. Uh, we just have to turn that camera off when we do measurements or somewhat uh, similar measurements. Um, the three meters is a little bit further away. Um, the biggest offenders that we typically have are monitors. Um, so one has to be careful with monitors. Um, on the other sites, uh, the uh, on the on the roof of the Agalanda Institute, uh, which yeah is shown here, um, there's no. I mean, there's the typical stuff around you. It's not always not uh, not always completely noise free um, from electronics in the building. Obviously, they have some heavy computers there. Um, but we have taken care that we're not too close to um, any stuff that's uh, that has monitors. Then uh, what I mentioned is because it's on on the rooftop overlooking the city, um, we were concerned about uh, RFI that is so heavy that it would overload the uh, the LNA, and we we have experienced that situation. Um, at another university, close by University of Cologne, very similar situation, rooftop of a building uh, overlooking the city. And they had a very little experiment with uh, wanting to see the hydrogen line. And they had used a, uh, a loop antenna um, to illuminate the dish. Well, it was a very small dish, I think only 80 centimeter and a loop antenna. And the loop antenna is not resonant enough. So they just, um, the, the LNA was completely overloaded from GSM. And we, we changed that to a uh, coffee can feed or uh, stove type, a stove pipe uh, feed, whatever you want to call it, and that cured the problem. So you want to have some discrimination at the antenna from out of band interference. You're always educating me. Uh, I've come up with three questions now. First off, TSM, <laughs> what is the translation of that one for us? Uh, TSM? What was? What, you just said uh, it had a lot of TSM. 
as if it was RFI, radio frequency. I think it was GSM, which is a... Uh, ah, GSM, yeah, G I said GSM. That's the uh, one of the um, mobile networks at, uh, that's oh, operating, wow. one of the operating frequencies in the 800 megahertz range. <clears throat> of course, and there, there are other uh, mobile bands in the 1500 and so on. But um, the name of the source, I see. Good. Yeah, yeah it's, that's the name of the network. O on or this the... picture here, um, I'm looking at the length of the coax. How long would that be? Um, the coax between the LNA and this is about 10 meters or so. Okay. And, and then... how long could we go? How long could that coax be? Um, Quite long, I'm thinking. In, well, in, in this case, um, we are uh, going with a Airflex 7 cable, which is more flexible uh, from the LNA to this cabinet here. I mean, I think that's about 10 meters. And then um, in the cabinet, we have the power injection, the bias T for the LNA. Right. And um, we have provisions to put in an additional amplifier in here, but we didn't need it then because then we are going maybe with another 10 meter of uh, Ecoflex 10 cable, which is more rigid, le uh, less. So we do have quite some attenuation between the LNA and then our SDR, but it's still quite okay. As I mentioned, the, we measured a system temperature of 100 Kelvin, which uh, I don't know whether we have much contribution due to the um, attenuation, maybe a bit, but it's not not severe. And uh, if it needs to be, you can put into this cabinet another line amplifier, but we, we didn't find it necessary so far. Would a coax confuse the spectrum in some way, warp it? I'm thinking not. Uh, not really. I mean, there, there, there are many other components in there which have a much less uh, flat spectrum. Of course, a coaxial cable has an increasing attenuation with frequency. So in principle, you would have a somewhat oh, yeah. higher uh, attenuation at higher frequencies. Th that's uh, hard, hard to even to measure, but yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. um, but mostly attenuation, exactly. Yeah, uh, it's attenuation. You had a Sorry. picture before of the 2.3, if we could. Uh, and at one point in the bottom section, you said that there were more than one uh, Sawbird amplifier. Is that true? Yeah, um, we have. In, well, in this case, we have dual polarization. Ah, yes. Um, we pick up uh, dual polarization, in which case, um, I'm not sure how well you can see. These are two Sawbirds, a previous version without a housing. With, with two and, co coax coming down from the dish. Yeah, two, uh, two co coax co are coming down from the dish. Um, so it's dual polarization, and we have two more uh, two uh, outputs going to the building. Is there any amplification up near the feed itself? At the feed, yes, of course. At the feed, we have the LNA. I mean, this is oh, okay. it always, there's always right there, uh, you need to have the first amplifier. Mm -hmm. And that's typically the one that will determine your noise figure and you should design it in such a way that that determines your noise figure. That's what I thought. So we're up to four LNAs now at this point. Um, what, what can we do with hydrogen with polarization? Not really much other than uh, getting a bit better signal to noise ratio. I mean, you have twice the power. Uh, oh, well, I guess. Uh, okay, sure. Yeah, so it's a square root of, a square root of two. That's what you're getting. But now you have to figure out what to do with it. Uh, so now we have amplified amplified signal there in your box. Uh, what do you do? Just mix them together? Uh, we bring them all the way back into um, the building. And there, uh, we, we could, uh, which we typically don't do, um, we, we could actually combine them into one signal, either having a dual uh, a uh, SDR with dual inputs, or we could probably just uh, add them in an amplifier with a, over a splitter. And what we sometimes do is, that's just a matter of convenience. Uh, we have one 
polarization configured for hydrogen and the other polarization configured for OH. With somehow the feeds are different? No, what we're doing is different filters. Um, oh, okay. We, we, um, at the LNA, we, we are wideband. We are going down and the filtering takes place in here. So in, actually in this case, in, at the time when I took the photograph, uh, we have the two inputs configured for hydrogen because we do have the saw bird here, which has a saw filter for hydrogen. But you see that's not used in this case. There's a cavity filter, which is for 1612. So this is an OH uh, line cavity filter, and there are post amplifiers uh, for that purpose. So we could replace the hydrogen saw bird by that configuration. Uh, it's just a matter of, uh, yeah, plugging the cable here. It's almost so comparison can, there. Uh, yeah. I could see two polarizations being helpful for pulsars just because such a weak signal. Is there another good use for two polarizations? Well, if you have a <clears throat> if you have a highly polarized um, signal, of course, um, that's helpful. You could also actually measure uh, polarization if you take the what is called the full spec, uh, Stokes uh, parameters. So if you have that, of course, that re requires you to have fully to be fully phase matched from the LNA all the way down to where you analyze. So it's fully phase match means, of course, same delay uh, over this over the line. So you can actually uh, make a polarization measurements where you if, let's say if you have a source and you want to know is it uh, what is the linear polarization, what is the circular polarization, then you can do that. That is something. Um, that we haven't done yet. Well, that's encouraging to me. Maybe I don't have to do it either. Uh, what would be the first source that would be polarized that I would care about? Well, certainly pulsars. They have a certain degree of polar polarization. They also, um, quite, it's quite possible that as the pulsar rotates, the orientation uh, rotates as well. So that is, in a way, that's a benefit because if you're if you're not perfect, correctly aligned, it will come anyway because it's rotating. Um, you probably have a better chance uh, not to miss something out on the polarization if you're dual, dual polarization for pulsars. And our on our big dish, I should say, yes, we're always uh, using dual polarization for all our measurements. And, and that's that's quite the installation, so that makes sense. Uh, but uh, what we're fighting there is with one polarization, I would see a fading in and out, a scintillation. Well, scintillation would affect essentially both polarizations. I, I mean, uh, oh, really? when, you when, okay. you, when you talk about um, scintillation, you're talking about a pulsar signal now? Yes. Yeah, um, that you would see it in both uh, in both polarizations. Oh, I thought it was kind of rotating. And so one would fade in and out. And I was explaining the scintillation by a polarization rotating. OK. No, it's not, not the polarization rotating. It's uh, it's the um, the fluctuation of the interstellar medium. Uh, quite, I mean, it's quite comparable to um, the twinkling of stars due to the fluctuations of the atmosphere. In this case, it's not the atmosphere, it doesn't matter, but uh, fluctuations in essentially of the electron density in the interstellar medium that uh, is the, the main I, I think of it as fog in the way, yes. Yeah, uh, it's... Uh, in the chat, you're getting all kinds of praise for your talk too, and I must add to that. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, I should have a look at the chips sorry well and it's it's should... there to see and but uh i don't mean to drown that out let's see turn uh, any questions in in the chat uh wolfgang the one thing that i've that i put in there the link that you have to uh, uh, 
Vidmar's uh, site is stale. Um, uh, okay. Bring it up. It comes up saying, oh, there's malware and all this other garbage there. Okay. So, um, and, and Ed provided a better link for, yeah. for oh. all of us. Thank you. Oh, I, I just clicked it and it did work for me. Uh, your That's link strange. or his link? The the link that um, I'm sorry, the link that was in the chat now that one that one works. Mm. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, we were having trouble with the link on your slide. Uh, okay, maybe I I have a typo in there or it didn't. Uh, um, no, we think just time has passed and things. Yeah, Bye. it looks like he got his own domain instead of working off of what was it ham site or something like that. Yeah, yeah, okay, that's yeah. But it's um, the the link that uh, I just clicked from from the chat that works fine, and that's exactly what I was referring to. And uh, um, something and that so we... you've made about five or six of these filters by now. Yeah, I think so. Uh, does that web page actually have it for 1420, or do we have to do a little math? No, you can have it directly for 1420. So if we click on that, and it's um, it's for all different kinds of frequencies, including uh, 1420, including 1612, which is OH, uh, including 60, 60, 1666, which is the middle of another two uh, OH lines. So it's all there. Uh, Wittmar, who did that, uh, he also does radio astronomy um, at times. And uh, so he he did design that for the other frequency. Also for, for a number of ham frequencies and also for the... 1090, which is the ADSB frequency and some some other frequency of interest. So it's it's really uh, I really like that. Uh, I have, I'm so grateful to Wittmar that he put it up because uh, it's so easy to make because you you don't have to have a milling machine and so on. You just buy the uh, buy the stuff. It may what I don't know though is. Um, because the US typically has different dimensions on things. Um, and he gives that in millimeters uh, and he uses common sizes that are common in Europe. So uh, you may have a little bit more difficulty um, when you buy similar things from the US. You would just have to check on what dimensions are available. Such an excellent starting point though. Thank you. Wolfgang, such a wonderful talk. Thank you much. And oh, thanks very much. Come along. Glad, glad you enjoyed it. And uh, oh, yeah, now, we all, let's see on your software, though. Um, you were writing software that was talking down to the soapy layer and such like that. Um, that is written in what kind of language on what operating system? It's uh, on Python. And, is it now? Uh, -hoo -hoo. It's it's all uh, the software that we um, that we use uh, to talk to the Soapy layer. I, actually, a large part of um, Soapy is is also Python, and we we uh, practically, with very little exceptions, we always use Linux. I think uh, you might also be able to run the same thing on, on a Windows environment. I think SOAPI is available for Windows, but we have never tried it. I and, agree uh, with your statements. And so I was looking at it for uh, that data collector that I wrote, EasyCall, to talk to many other kinds of hardware instead of the cheap RTL SDR. Um, and I made a little progress on the uh, AirSpy, but I didn't quite get it to work. Um, how can I look at your Python code? Is it available someplace? Yeah, um, I think the starting point would be um, if you, well, have a look for SOAPI SDR. That would be the starting point because in, in any case, what you would need is to install uh, that framework. Oh, so and essentially... I've done that and I, uh, I got okay. pretty, pretty much got it kind of to work but I just wasn't getting a spectrum out. So I, I've done some technically wrong thing in just talking to it, but I'm close. 
And so uh, okay. perhaps your code would give me the magic. Yeah, I, I can send you um, our code from the uh, Spectrum Emitter 2. Uh, by the way, what we are using to do the FFT, um, there is a, a module which we are using, because I have to say I'm lazy. So I try to reuse what other people have done. There's something which is called Soapy Power, uh, which essentially gives you a spectrum. Oh, that's part of the Soapy package. Okay. Yeah, it's sort of an. It, I've been using the Python uh, math functions and things like that. But okay, I'm all, open to all things. Now, why that yeah. one? Uh, because it was, it was simply quite easy. And it is um, in the background, again, it's using some of or different, it can use different uh, FFT um, algorithms that are also available, some of the standard FFT things. And they give a recommendation on which one is the most efficient. Um, so that's uh, what we are using. Uh, so essentially, our our program, I think the trickier part of our program is not actually uh, talking to the SDR and, talk, and getting the spectrum. The trickier part is at the same time communicating our uh, to, to our uh, control software, which I mean, it's not tricky, but uh, it's, that's that's specific to our control software. And um, then, as you may recall, we always like to write uh, things into FITS files, and that's the other part. Uh, but the whole program essentially is a wrapper around using um, the SOAPY bit and pieces, uh, essentially SOAPY power, which then talks uh, to uh, SOAPY SDR, and then uh, writing it as a FITS file in order to complement the header of the FITS file we just read from our uh, from our control system. Sure, I understand all that, but th those are really separate issues, and so I can separate them. At yeah, the you can separate them. That works that just fine. Um, I'll work on one at a time. Uh, first was to get simply support more radios underneath me, and I think that'd be helpful to many. Yeah, I mean, I think this is really um, very helpful if you just uh, don't have to change much or anything if you want to use a different radio. Uh, when you send it to me, I have your permission to go ahead and steal the code from it and put it to use? Uh, there's one limitation. We don't want to uh, come it up in commercial environments. Correct. And uh, I'm already doing that with GitHub, that uh, m all my code is free for the world. Yeah, that's that's something that we, we don't do. <laughs> um, we're, we're a little bit careful about that for two reasons. Um, reason number one is uh, typically if you put out software in the wild, uh, you are you're getting um, support questions. And this is something I cannot <laughs> do. The, the, second, the second thing, um, Uh, to put it very straightforward, uh, I talked about this company Radio to Space and their software problems. I don't want to solve their software problems for free. Uh, correct. Uh, it, it leads to lots of telephone calls back to you. You don't want that <laughs> burden. That's the support issue. And yeah. uh, if uh, someone, if it falls on someone's foot, it's not your fault. Yeah. Yeah. So. I understand that completely, but mm -hmm. I, I would be stealing certain lines from inside of the technique that you finally used. I mean, if you documented uh, somewhere uh, in Soapy already. We can take it offline. I'll, I'll send you something, and then I'll give you some guidance on what you can use and what you can't use. I think my main motivation is, um, as I said, um, having it in the context of commercial products, that's something that should not go without a license fee because they're making I, money on it and we have to maintain our telescopes. And the other part is uh, avoiding uh, having to answer support questions. Very good. Just, well, we will begin the process and we'll keep consulting, making sure yep. that everybody's happy. Sounds good. Yep. Okay. Uh, I'm eager to get that from you. You can find my email, I'm sure. Yeah, I, I know. Thank you Pleasure. again. A question. From Green Bank. Yes. Okay. I noticed you had taken patterns on the feed horns. Yes. Do you have the facility to take actual patterns on the complete assembly, the dish? 
when we uh, what we can do, I mean, I'm not sure whether we are talking the, the same thing. If we want to take a pattern on the dish, um, we, we don't typically take a full pattern. Uh, we make a cut in azimuth and elevation, but rather than taking a real full pattern. 